Emily Chang. This is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, big week for Uber as the company's losses widen in the third quarter, and SoftBank seeks shares at a discount. Plus, our exclusive conversation with HPE CEO Meg Whitman as she prepares to leave the company. We cover a wide range of topics from HPE's transformation to her political ambitions. And GM's self-driving car, our test ride in the Chevy Bolt, and my conversation with GM president Dan Ammon. But first to our lead. Uber's losses widened in the third quarter. According to people familiar with the matter, the ride-hailing service lost almost a billion and a half dollars in the period. This all came to light when Uber reported its financials to shareholders Tuesday night as part of a formal bid from a SoftBank-led consortium looking to buy a large block of stock. SoftBank could get a nice discount. The sale of those shares would value Uber at $48 billion, a 30% discount to its last private valuation, which had Uber coming in at $69 billion. We caught up with someone intimately familiar with Uber's inner workings, Lane Castleman, managing partner at Greenbrier and former head of communications for Uber in the Americas. Bloomberg Tech's Eric Newcomer also joined us on the set. Yeah, and this is sort of the opening salvo from SoftBank and its consortium of investors saying, all right, we'll pay $33 a share, which translates into that $48 billion valuation, and see if we can get enough people to bite at that to meet the 14% of outstanding shares that we want to acquire. In and this what's deal. the likelihood of that? Well, I think that's the debate we're going to have. I think, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of appetite for liquidity, and that's what SoftBank is counting on, that people want to sell their shares and that they don't want to miss out. So people might offer them up, knowing that if the price goes up, they'll, they'll be able to offer them at the higher price later. Lane, you've been talking to former employees. You have shares to sell yourself. What are employees talking about right now? I mean, I think employees have a lot of confusion going on right now. Um, there's not a lot of information out, right? Pretty much all we know is what we're reading in the press. There's not been any communication from the company yet, at least to former employees. Right now, everyone's wondering, can I sell? Right? Will I be able to exercise and see some kind of uh, monetary value from this stock I've been sitting on for such a long time? What do employees feel about a big discount like this? Which still is a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for each employee, it's probably a very um, uh, emotional uh, emotional issue, right? They need to determine whether or not uh, the lower value would translate to enough income for them for what they believe their stock is worth. So how would this shake up the power structure, Eric? So the entire slate of governance reforms is tied to this. So, you know, the 17-person board, that happens if this deal goes through, two seats for SoftBank, some of Travis Kalanick's power gets restricted because the super voting shares lose some of their power. So all of that is contingent on this deal going through. It's sort of separate, but they've been attached by the board so that there's a lot of pressure to get this thing done. And the reality is, Lane, that employees don't have much say in the price that gets set here. This is really down to Uber's biggest investors, the biggest shareholders, like Travis Kalanick himself, right? That's right. I think most employees maybe have a bit of a misconception that they actually have a say in what's going to happen next. There's a handful of people, maybe eight entities, a couple employees, mostly investors, that have all the say in what happens next. Uh, we're just along for the ride, and hopefully it's a good one. So, Eric, what kind of negotiations are happening right now behind the scenes? Well, right now I think it's a matter of signatures, getting the documents out. The documents are going to contain financial information about the company, risk factors, probably a mention of this hack that happened, and say, okay, you're selling your shares, you need to know something about the value of those shares so you can fairly assess. SoftBank knows a ton about Uber at this point, so they're making a very calculated decision about the shares' values. Former employees and other sellers will have to do the same. We also wonder what we don't know, the, the other skeletons in the closet. Lane, you're a communications expert. What do you make of the, the, the news of this big hack being revealed just as all of this is coming together? Yeah, so, I mean, Emily, I don't really believe in coincidence, and the fact that this leaked out two days before Thanksgiving in the midst of the soft pink deal is a little too perfect. Um, and I think there was probably some intention behind it to help push the investors to making a deal quickly with SoftBank. So, Eric, another thing happening right now, the Waymo trial, that has been postponed. Yep. Today, the judge had very harsh words for Uber about another cover-up. What exactly happened? Yeah, he <laughs> really laid into Uber. I mean, they got this letter from a former employee that basically indicated that Uber had used uh, encrypted messages and sort of practiced deleting uh, communications so that they couldn't 
be found in court later, you know? And that's, that's super important here because Google's been trying to turn up the 14,000 files. And so now there's a question of whether they would ever be able to find them if Uru is sort of systematically using encrypted and disappearing messaging services. Now, Elaine, obviously, it, it seems like Uber is going to be dealing with some cleanup for a long time. If you're Dara Khosrowshahi right now, what are you doing to find what other skeletons there are in the closet? Yeah, right. You're, you're mostly worried about what you don't know and what's coming next. Uh -huh. I mean, I think you have to do a top-down review of each division, each team, each department, uh, and try and find out, are there other issues like this that exist? Um, but hopefully, most of them are already exposed. But you know what? As CEO, your job is to deal with these as they unfold. And there's 15,000 employees now. There's probably some other stuff out there that will um, bubble up over the next couple of months and couple of years. That's his job to manage it. Remind us, Eric, of all the other open issues. London, the other investigations. Right. I mean, I think right now, Joe Sullivan, the a chief security officer who was pushed out as part of this hack, is tied to a lot of these key questions. His security team is being looked at closely. I think Tony West, the new general counsel, is going to have to look into what the strategic services group, basically Uber's internal counterintelligence group, did who they surveilled, how they looked, all that sort of stuff, the physical intelligence, and then whether there was any hacking against competitors. There are just a lot of questions sort of on what happened there in relationship to the Waymo case and other cases. So that's a whole set of issues, but I mean, there are five criminal probes as of October that are open, so to list them all is nearly impossible. You know, there, there are a ton of issues that U.S. attorney's offices are looking at now to try and figure out whether anything was criminal. Coming up, we will hear from Uber board member Ariana Huffington, her take on the startup's cultural U-turn and sexual harassment from Silicon Valley to Washington. Plus, how Cyber Monday sales stacked up this year. We will dig into the numbers. This is Bloomberg. The chairman of the FCC is going on the offensive, defending plans to repeal net neutrality protections. Ajit Pai, who's been the FCC chair since January, took issue with everyone from web companies to celebrities who have lambasted his plans to dismantle the Obama-era internet protections. He took particular aim at Twitter, saying, quote, when it comes to an open internet, Twitter is part of the problem. The company has a viewpoint and uses that viewpoint to discriminate. Now to Cyber Monday. Amazon said this year was the biggest shopping day ever in the company's history. And according to Adobe Analytics, Cyber Monday raked in $6.59 billion in online sales. That is up over 16% from previous years. We spoke with Bloomberg's Emma Chandra from New York on Monday as the numbers were still rolling in. So one of the things, you mentioned Adobe Systems there, and they have come out with the biggest prediction for the day in terms of sales. They're expecting $6.6 .6 billion in sales. That would be the most ever in the US. And as you mentioned, um, they're saying as of 4.30, they'd kind of done, they're seeing half of that um, being achieved. We heard from them earlier in the day where they noted that web traffic was up. And they also noted that mobile uh, commerce was winning the day with traffic growing for about tw growing about 21% and accounting for more than 50% of all visits online and that's a trend that we've been seeing all year and actually for a number of years in terms of the growth of e-commerce but also the growth of mobile shopping and if you take a look at the terminal here I've got G hashtag BTV 1928 and what you can see here is that uh, mobile e-commerce is now a good 20% of all e-commerce uh, we've also heard from first data uh, they're the biggest mobile payments company uh, in the US and they were saying that they cyber Monday has got off to a very solid start um, for e-commerce. They're seeing strong and steady growth throughout the morning and into the afternoon. And they've said overall through the first 14 hours of the day, they'd say that Cyber Monday will show some very strong year-on-year -year growth trends. So, Emma, talk to us about who the likely big winners are, or is it all about Amazon? Uh, we always talk a lot about Amazon because um, as the biggest uh, online uh, company, uh, everybody thinks that they're going to be the winners. We know that traditional retailers, a lot of the department stores, are continuing to promote and offer deals today as they have done all weekend and indeed all month. Um, but really, it is considered that uh, Amazon and Walmart, the big online marketplaces, will be the big winners today. 
today. They're competing on deals like flat screen televisions, toys, gadgets, a big push towards appliances and electronics. Um, we heard Bain say that Amazon alone is expected to capture half of all e-commerce holiday spending growth. And we heard back on Friday from GBH Insights, um, who said that Amazon had captured about 50% of all the online spending um, on Black Friday. Uh, take a look at another chart that I have for you here. It's G hashtag BTV8686. Uh, and what you can see is that while Amazon, uh, which is the blue line here, is soaring ahead of Walmart when it comes to market cap, when you look at sales, this is the bar chart underneath Walmart is doing, uh, continues to outperform uh, Amazon. So, Emma, you know, I was surprised to see that in-store sales, physical store sales, still, still account for 90% of retail purchases. So when it comes to e-commerce, there's still a lot of growth to be had. I mean, talk to us about the trends we're seeing when it comes to online versus offline commerce. Uh, that's absolutely true. It's always quite surprising uh, to see that number, that e-commerce just makes up at about 10 11% of all retail sales. But the growth momentum is really with e-commerce, which is why there's such a big focus on e-commerce, both within uh, analysts and investors looking at the industry and, of course, among retailers themselves. Um, and if you take, just take a look at some of the predictions for the holiday season as a whole and not just this weekend, you see holiday sales growth as a whole being uh, predicted between 3 and 5, 3.5 uh, and 4.5 percent. But if you look at the estimates for e-commerce growth, they're up towards, uh, towards more like 20 percent. And that's why we're seeing traditional retailers uh, like the Macy's of the world, like Target, it, like Walmart, that they've been um, sort of ahead of the game for, for a while now, really focusing on what they're uh, offering online. And one of the things that we saw from analysts who were reporting on what we saw on Black Friday, they said that what had been very promising this year among the traditional retailers was that they had better integrated the deals and promotions uh, for their um, uh, for products that you can buy both in store and online, so a customer could find uh, the same thing at the same price whether they went in store or they went online. All right, and the day is not yet done. Still a few more hours to capitalize on some of those deals. Bloomberg's Emma Chandra for us in New York. Emma, thanks so much. Staying with e-commerce, the increase in online transactions also means an increased risk of cyber attacks. In the fourth quarter of last year, there was a 20% jump in attempted hacks from November to December. Joining us from Boston, Carbon Black CEO Patrick Morley. So Patrick, uh, what are you seeing so far this year? Are you seeing a similar type of increase? Well, the analysis that we did based on the data that we collect uh, was done on 2016, and we saw a, a material increase, as you said, 20% increase in the month of December. And so we anticipate that this year we're going to see the same type of increase uh, year over year uh, in the month of December. And, and the primary driver on that is that it provides the attacker, the, the people who are trying to make money typically, all of the noise happening, like what you just spoke about in regards to Cyber Monday, all of that provides great cover for attackers to go and, and get consumers and get enterprises. Now, as I understand it, phishing attacks have been the most common. Tell us about that. Well, certainly phishing attacks uh, are, are used in a big way out there by attackers, and they leverage, uh, they leverage social engineering. Uh, and again, going back to during the holiday season, all of us are receiving in our inbox many offers from retailers, uh, from shipping companies, uh, holiday cards, et cetera, and we're trained to open those. We want to click on those links. Uh, and yet, uh, an attacker knows that just as well as we do, and so they leverage that to get us to click on the link, uh, to go to a malicious website, uh, and to actually or to drop malicious code onto, a, onto an unknowing consumer or an unknowing uh, employee, uh, and then they're able to, to actually make an attack. Now, we spent a lot of time covering the Equifax hack earlier this year. Have consumers uh, been more wary this holiday season? Are retailers doing anything differently as a result? Well, I think it cuts both ways uh, for consumers because uh, breaches have been in the, in the news a lot. Uh, as you said, Equifax and certainly a lot of the ransomware that we heard about this year. So there's an awareness that goes up. At the same time, the holidays are a hectic time uh, for all of us uh, in our jobs and also uh, trying to buy presents and do other things uh, at the end of the year here. And so all of that, as I said earlier, all that noise 
uh, put, allows us to put our guard down a bit and it creates additional, additional risk for sure. You know, retailers are smart about this. Retailers recognize this, both online retailers as well as uh, those who uh, run physical stores and point of sale systems are very aware of this and they definitely uh, put additional security around uh, this time of year in order to protect their, their consumers. That was Carbon Black CEO Patrick Morley. And a possible movie merger announced this week. The U.S.'s number two movie chain, Regal Entertainment, is said to be in talks with the U.K.'s Cineworld Group. According to people familiar with the matter, the deal would create a bigger international rival to industry leader AMC Entertainment. Now remember, Regal tried to find a buyer in 2014, but was unsuccessful. Coming up, General Motors is taking its self-driving flagship car out of the showroom and onto the streets. Just how it fared in real life traffic next. And they used to be fierce rivals in the race to dominate China's Uber-like trucking apps. Now they are joining forces. Next, this is Bloomberg. General Motors finally let its self-driving cars loose on the streets of San Francisco. This week, Chevrolet unveiled its autonomous car, the Bolt, which is powered by technology from Cruise. We got the chance to take it on a hands-free ride, or should I say it took me on a ride. So we're waiting for our car. The name of our car is Pickle. We're going to take a drive to the bay. Pickle is here. All right, let's do this. All right, we made it. Okay, we covered 2.4 miles, drove past 178 people, nine bikes, and 148 cars. Definitely a little jerky, some stopping and starting at times. You could uh, sense the car, trying to figure out what people were gonna do. Were they kids playing with a ball? Were they construction workers who weren't going to move? Um, but I'm in for round two. I think it'll get better next time. Now, right after that ride, I sat down with General Motors President Dan Ammon to see just why they decided to let us ride in a self-driving car that isn't quite ready for consumer launch just yet. Take a listen. Our objective is to deploy these cars uh, in the most complex environments. That's why we're testing and demonstrating here in San Francisco. We want to deploy with scale and we want to deploy uh, with a really high level of safety. Um, so that's what we're uh, marching towards. We've been moving at a really fast rate of development. That's why we wanted to give people like you an opportunity to experience the cars today, again, operating in this really, really complex environment. So we're, we're moving quickly. Uh, we're, we're heading towards uh, commercial deployment in some quarters uh, away from now. Now, and uh, we're really excited about the rate of progress. Some quarters, how many quarters? Some number of quarters, <laughs> quarters not years. Okay, so my ride experience was fascinating. Definitely some stopping and starting. I understand it's a complex environment. You know, there were a couple of times where, you know, it tried to merge, but then there was a car there when we jerked back in. Uh, there was a time we pulled up to some kids crossing a crosswalk and you could see the car realizing, oh, this is a long line of children, not just one or two, but it got a little confused. How long will it take to smooth over those kinds of issues? So safety is absolutely the number one priority. And so part of the experience you would have noticed today is that the car is relatively cautious. Um, but again, that's all about safety and safety will be the defining metric that tells us when we're ready to actually uh, deploy these cars. We're moving really quickly in terms of continued performance improvement, and that's why we want to give people an opportunity to experience the cars today. And then, you know, some number of months from now, people can get another, another read on where we are and, and see the rate of change. You know, how do you decide when you're at a point where this car would make the same decision that a human driver would? Well, that's really what we're aiming for. We understand pretty well human driver level of performance, and we want to make sure that we can deliver that, that same level of performance and, frankly, better over time. There's still a, a steering wheel, there are still pedals, still a safety driver. Right. How far away are you from a car without a wheel, without pedals? 
Well, it's, it's back to this, you know, what needs to be true to launch commercially, and that's getting the right level of, uh, of safety performance. And as soon as we get to that level in time, we'll be able to pull the driver out of the car, the, the safety driver out of the car, and that will afford us an opportunity to rethink uh, what the car might look like. What about affordability? Are they even close to being affordable, even for fleet companies? Well, one of the reasons that we think a rideshare environment is the logical place to deploy these cars is we can get a really high rate of utilization on them. So even in the early days when the cars are expensive and the sensor technology is expensive, we'll still have a really compelling business case and still be able to offer rides at a, at a more affordable rate uh, than, uh, than where human drivers are at today. Can you give us an idea of how much it costs to make one now? Um, I could, but I'm not going to give you a number. <laughs> okay. Um, so then what is the strategy to bring these to market? So again, first thing is to get to the level of performance that we want to have. And once we're at that point in time, uh, we see the logical first uh, mode of deployment being into a shared network in a complex environment, urban environment. Um, so a, you know, a ride share type uh, model. You've partnered with Lyft. You've made a big strategic investment with Lyft. You also have an agreement with Uber uh, to rent them a small number of cars. Whose side are you on? So our objective, again, is to get this technology deployed in, in the largest scale possible uh, uh, with the right level of safety. As we think about how we ultimately do that, we could uh, have one partner. We could have more than one partner. We could potentially have no partners at all. Mm. What do you think you'll have? I mean, what, what, what looks like the most plausible scenario for you? How do you work through those scenarios? I'd say at this point in time, all options remain open. Uh, as we get closer and closer to commercial launch, that those plans will begin to crystallize. Now, you know, we see the iterations of the various cars here. You know, looking towards the next iteration, how, you know, how do you get the equipment smaller and sleeker? How do you make it look more like just another car on the road? So what we're doing here is we're iterating at an unprecedented pace. So we're, we're, we get, you see three generations of car here. We're working on a fourth generation right now. All of that's happened in less than 18 months, uh, which is a really rapid hardware iteration cycle. And we're going to continue those iterations you know, as we get closer to and through commercial launch and, frankly, afterwards as well. So we're going to keep that moving. How critical is the LiDAR technology, and is it possible to have self-driving cars without it? Uh, right now, we think LiDAR is a really important part of the equation. Uh, what we've been working on, we made an acquisition uh, just recently, is getting the, the, the cost of the LiDAR sensors down dramatically. We think we can reduce that by you know, almost 99% uh, from where we are today to where we uh, uh, could be in the relatively near future to get the performance up uh, and to get the reliability up. And we think with that combination uh, of characteristics, we're going to have a, a really compelling multi-layer sensor suite. One of the most rewarding parts of the experience I thought was being able to see the app, see see the car, see cars on the road, people on the road, and the objects moving across the screen. How, how does that all come together? So uh, the car is obviously evaluating everything that's going on around it at a point in time, and it's making predictions as to what all of those different uh, sort of characters are going to do, and then it, it plans its path um, around that. And so what you saw was a representation of what the car is seeing and how it's thinking about that environment. Is that based on cruise, or is that other technology? That's all internally developed technology. All internally developed technology. So um, when it comes to cruise, is cruise doing all of its high-definition maps in-house? And if so... How does it differentiate itself from competitors? So what we're doing is making sure that we control uh, all of those pieces of the total system that we need to to move as quickly as we can. So we're doing a lot of our own mapping work. We're doing, you know, obviously all of our own self-driving software and a lot of work on the hardware side. So we want to keep iterating the entire system as quickly as we can. And by controlling all of those pieces, it enables us to move more quickly. Can you give us an update on sales of the Chevy Bolt in general? Uh, Chevy Bolt uh, sales uh, have been uh, going really well. Uh, we had a record month last month. We expect to have another record month this month. Uh, we're feeling really good about the trajectory. So a year from now, where will GM self-driving efforts be? Uh, we will be, uh, in, I think, in a pretty interesting position a year from now. Uh, and uh, we look forward to keeping you updated on What's that. What's been your most interesting experience? Uh, in a, it's in really, a self-driving car. It's really just been to see the rate of progress that we've been making. Um, so it's been really exciting over the last 18 months from, from the time that we acquired Cruise, the rate of change to bear w where we are today, able to share that with you and others, um, you know, to get a sense for where we are and with a pretty clear line of sight on uh, getting to the point where we can launch this commercially. Would you take your family on a road trip in this yet? <laughs> we've still got development work to go, but ultimately that's the objective. Coming up, our exclusive conversation with HPE CEO Meg Whitman as she prepares to leave the company after almost seven years at the helm. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. HPE CEO Meg Whitman is preparing to step down from the company in February. This week, she joined us for a wide-ranging, exclusive conversation from HPE's Discover Conference in Madrid. We discussed her decision to leave and why the time is right for her now and for HPE. I've led a transformation that might be one of the biggest transformations in global business history from a single company, enormous company um, that was really facing a lot of challenges to four very nimble, agile companies with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the one that I still run, really well positioned for the future. And this has been in the works for some time and uh, just decided that, you know, it's right for the next generation of leaders to take Hewlett Packard forward. And as you know, Emily, you and I have talked before. I'm a big believer in the right person in the right job at the right time. And I think Antonio Neri is going to be a fantastic next CEO. So why do you think Antonio is the guy for the job, somebody who's been there for decades? Well, I have said from the beginning of my tenure at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the next CEO of this company needed to come from the inside. When you come from the outside, which I did, the length of time it takes to understand the people, the products, the culture, the market, it takes a long time. And Antonio and I have crafted the strategy for Hewlett Packard Enterprise together. He will now execute that strategy as a standalone company. And he's a deep technologist. And the next CEO, I think, needs to be a deeper technologist than I am. Listen, you will recall, I'm more of a consumer technologist. I had to learn enterprise technology in his bones um, 22 years. He is an enterprise technology executive. And I think he's going to take this company to a place I never dreamed I could. Now, some of the critics would argue that HPE needs a landscape shift and that appointing an insider who's been there for a very long time isn't a veer away. How do you respond to that? Well, think about the transformation that we have undergone as HP as a whole, but also in terms of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We shrunk down to about a $24 billion company. Then we've made six or seven acquisitions in the last six months, the largest one being Aruba, which is a fantastic acquisition, has opened up a whole new growth frontier for the company in what we call the intelligent edge. And Gartner published a study that said the edge is going to eat the cloud because so much data is being um, generated at the edge that it will require compute and storage at the edge to, to get those insights. So I think the company is in actually very good shape. We are less dependent on the commodity server business than we were six years ago. We've got value products and growth products. We're the leader in high-performance compute. We've created a whole new category called composable infrastructure with our lead product called Synergy. We've developed flexible com uh, consumption pricing so that you can keep workloads on-prem and pay for them as you uh, consume the compute and storage. So I think we're actually in quite good shape with a very coherent strategy that's matched to the needs of the market now. How do you turn around enterprise spending when more and more companies are outsourcing to cloud service providers? Yeah, well, so, of course, that takes a certain percentage of our market, largely the commodity server-oriented business. But there are still many workloads that are staying on-prem. And a recent trend we've seen is really a multi-cloud strategy. Some workloads might be in a public cloud, maybe multiple public clouds. Some might be in a managed uh, service provider. And some will remain on-prem. And we've seen some companies moving workloads back on-prem because it's gotten so expensive in the, in the public cloud. So what we have to do is in enable a hybrid IT solution for customers and helping them figure out what the right mix is where their workloads should live. And that's a capability that we're growing. We acquired a company called Cloud Technology Partners. That's what Cloud Technology Partners does is help companies figure out where those workloads should go. And we need, need to enable the future. And then, of course, the edge is as much pressure as the data center is under. The edge is not. And the edge is growing like a weed. Autonomy was a big acquisition that went bad for the former HP done before your time. Has that put a big chill on M&A that's a little bit outside the wheelhouse? Or do you think HPE will still be creative when it comes to thinking about doing deals? Yeah. 
Well, listen, I think the company did have some post-traumatic stress syndrome after the autonomy acquisition. And we didn't make any acquisitions until Aruba. And Aruba, we had to be very thoughtful. Um, we probably took due diligence to an extreme in Aruba. I remember saying to Damor and Kirti Mulcati, um, I'm sorry about this, but you are the first acquisition after autonomy. So it's going to feel pretty tough, I think. But Aruba has been an incredible acquisition for us. And I think we've gotten our momentum back around M&A. We've made six or seven very successful acquisitions. Aruba has been fantastic. Simplivity, Nimble, Niara, Cloud Technology Partners. So I think we now know what, what acquisitions work for us. And it is complementary technology that we can put through our fantastic distribution center, distribution system of direct salespeople and our partners um, and accelerate uh, the growth of those companies and maybe take out some cost in overhead and GNA. So we have a formula now and we also have to buy these companies right. We cannot overpay and we haven't overpaid to date. And I think we're beginning to get now a lot of momentum, a lot of know-how and frankly confidence um, from the street that we know how to do good acquisitions. So in what areas do you think HPE will be doing some deal hunting? Yeah. So remember our strategy is threefold. First, we make hybrid IT simple. We power the intelligent edge, and we have the services to make it happen for our customers. So our most recent acquisition was in services, Cloud Technology Partners, as I, as I mentioned. We acquired Cloud Cruiser that allows companies to meter how much technology they are using. So we'll be looking for um, certainly services acquisitions, small services acquisitions. Then something might come up in the intelligent edge or IoT that's particularly germane to our view of that. We've made a couple of acquisitions for Aruba, Niara, which is behavioral analytics that help with security. Rasa Networks is another one. And then on hybrid IT, we're really interested in the software-defined infrastructure space. So SimpliVity was a natural. We took our user interface, the SimpliVity fabric, and put it on the most prevalent server in the world, the DL380, uh, the ProLiant DL380. And so that's turning out to be a winner for us as well. But you can count on acquisitions, if we make them, only in those three areas. We're going to stick right to those three areas because we think there's a lot of room in making hybrid IT simple, powering the intelligent edge, and having the services to make it happen for clients. We then moved on to discuss another topic she's very passionate about, the current political landscape. We began with one of the hottest topics in Washington, tax reform. I think we appreciate the reduction in um, corporate tax rates, although we pay below 35 percent, as do most U.S. corporations, but it will help on the margin for sure. We like the territorial tax system where we could bring cash that is trapped overseas back, and we would make investments either in the United States or return cash to shareholders, which is also good for the economy. So there's a lot that we like about it. I think being a Californian, it's going to be challenging for people who live in California, New York, New Jersey, if uh, uh, that state income tax uh, deduction against your federal return is lost, that's going to make it more expensive to hire people in California than in other locations. So I don't think it hurts necessarily the United States, but I think it will put some pressure on our California workforce and, and maybe you know other companies' workforce in high state tax, uh, state tax jurisdictions. So the big question is what you are doing next. Any interest in re-entering politics okay. or have politics become too toxic? Well, I will not be in elected politics again. I can't imagine it. Um, you know, I tried my hand at that in 2010. I learned a tremendous amount. I'm a better CEO for it. But I think it's probably not my future. Um, and so I'm not sure what I'll do. I'm certainly going to take some time off. And, uh, you know, I've been working pretty hard and continuously since I was 22 years old. So I'll take a little time off and uh, see what the future reveals. And I'm a does, big believer does, that things reveal themselves. I mean, if you had, if you told me after the 2010 governor's race that I'd be the CEO of HP, I would have said there is no possible way uh, that that would happen. And yet it did. So we'll see what comes next. Our exclusive interview with HPE CEO Meg Whitman there. And on to another revolving door in tech. Speculation over Disney CEO Bob Iger's successor has narrowed down to a single candidate. Bob Chapek, the head of Disney's Parks and Resorts division, is now viewed as the top contender. Chapek, who's been at the company for more than two decades, helped oversee the launch of Shanghai Disneyland, which went on to exceed 11 million visitors in its first year. Iger is scheduled to retire in July 2019, leaving 19 months to complete a transition for the top job.
Coming up, Thrive Global CEO and Uber board member Ariana Huffington talks about raising money for the startup, Uber's cultural turnaround, and the sexual harassment scandals rocking tech, media, and Washington. This is Bloomberg. Alibaba is planning a $7 billion bond offering. This would be the largest U.S. dollar bond sale by an Asian corporate issuer this year. The Chinese e-commerce giant plans to offer the notes in five parts. Maturities will range from five and a half to 40 years. The deal would eclipse the $6.6 billion offering from China Evergrande in June. This week, we caught up with Uber board member and Thrive Global CEO Ariana Huffington. We covered quite a number of important headlines from the week, from Uber's 2016 hack that just came to light to the wave of sexual harassment scandals in tech and media. But we began on the latest $30 million funding round at Huffington's company Thrive, led by IVP and the next phase for the startup. Huffington was joined by Samesh Dash, IVP general partner. We spent the first year um, with multiple clients around the world, uh, refining our IP, our behavior change, pathways, micro steps, and now with this new funding, we'll be able to productize it, to actually create digital science-based behavior change offerings, both for corporations around the world and for consumers, to help them reduce the stress and burnout in their lives, while improving their productivity. I think at the heart of Thrive Global is this um, fact, which is entirely science-based, that our well-being and our performance are tied together. They rise and fall together. And when companies realize that, they will uh, continue to accelerate their investment in their human capital, because that has immediate and verifiable um, impact on the bottom line. Samesh, you're joining the board of, of Thrive. IVP has also invested in Twitter, in Snap, in Slack. What do you see in a company like Thrive, besides the founder being Ariana Huffington? Well, thanks for having me, Emily. I think the big thing we look for is evidence of product market fit and hyper growth. And what was amazing is when we looked at Thrive compared to other enterprise focused companies that we'd invest in, including Success Factors, Domo, and others of those sort, Thrive's first year is out the gate in terms of customer adoption, uh, revenue growth growth were phenomenal in the top quartile of all deals that we've done and much far above what we typically look at. And beyond that, I think we sort of look for in enterprise businesses evidence of land, expand, renew, and refer. So they were landing big customers with actually sizable contracts. Even before they had a fully fledged sales force when they were experimenting, they were renewing those contracts before those contracts were even due. They were expanding into different departments and different use cases. And then the best part that we really look for is, is the customer referring this product, this service over to other people in the industry? Because people in human capital know each other very well, and it's a small, close-knit community. Ariana, you're trying to do something very difficult, which is change behavior. What kind of change are you actually seeing, and how much more work is there to be done? Emily, there is a lot of work to be done, but what is exciting is that we're at a tipping point, that more and more individuals and more and more companies are realizing that we have been living under this delusion that in order to succeed, you have to burn out. So what we've done, as well as our B2B offerings, we've created a media platform which takes everything I've learned from 12 years at the Huffington Post and basically brings together the latest science that proves unequivocally that that in fact, when we take care of ourselves, when we put our own oxygen mask on first, we are more effective at work. And also new role models, people in the arena, very successful people like Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Eric Schmidt and Sheryl Sandberg, writing about how they prioritize their own well-being and that makes them better at work. Jeff Bezos, for example, wrote a piece that went crazy viral and the headline was, why am I getting eight hours of sleep is good for Amazon shareholders? And he actually broke it down that when he got only six hours sleep, his decisions, he wrote, were not as good. And uh, as he put it, my value is not in the amount of decisions I make, but in the quality of decisions. 
So people want that reinforcement, uh, that permission, if you want, that goes against a lot of our mainstream culture, which still valorizes people who are always on, who never recharge, and ignores the data that that has a very negative impact on business metrics. So, Mesh, when it comes to entrepreneurs, your funding, and the way you communicate with your portfolio companies, how do you deal with these kinds of issues? Well, it's, it's become a real issue, as Ariana said, Emily. I mean, when we see hypergrowth companies, what we're attracted to is just the breakneck speed at which they're executing. But what she's referring to is absolutely the case where we've seen a number of our portfolio companies, people burning out. When they're doing exit interviews, we have the chance to sometimes see their feedback. And the feedback is, I wish I had a chance to build more deeper relationships with my coworkers. I wish I had a time to actually process some of the things that I'm building and learning about. So I think what we really uh, are at is this tipping point in our culture where healthcare costs have skyrocketed in this country. And today it's not a fringe HR discussion. This is a CEO level discussion about saying, how do we attract, retain, and actually uh, replenish our workforce where we have amazing people that want to come to work excited about the day ahead and leave fulfilled. And I think that's the opportunity that Ariana is bringing content towards uh, addressing. Uh, speaking about another potential tipping point, uh, I have to ask you guys about the continued sexual harassment and discrimination allegations that are impacting not just tech, but the media industry, politics. Matt Lauer was just fired from NBC. Charlie Rose fired from CBS. Bloomberg has ended its production and distribution arrangement with Charlie Rose. Ariana, as a media mogul yourself, how big a blow is this to these franchises, and how do they recover from what seems to be very bad behavior by very powerful men? Well, what we are seeing, Emily, is all these companies moving very fast, making decisions very fast, ending contracts very fast. And this is an indication of the cultural moment we are in, a cultural moment truly of uh, zero tolerance, where behavior that has been quietly accepted for decades is no longer accepted. It's a very, very important moment and it's a moment which is going to make it much easier for women uh, to flourish in workplaces and to rise in workplaces because again and again we've seen how prevalent sexism um, has made it much harder for women um, to have sustainable careers in many uh, businesses whether media entertainment or uh, anywhere else so, you know, when it comes to Washington, Senator Al Franken, Ariana, I know some photos of you and him surfaced. There continues to be this question of where do we draw the line, and you've defended him. Why? Well, Emily, the pictures of Al and me were an extension of a comedic sketch that he and I did uh, probably before you were born uh, <laughs> called, uh, called Strange Bedfellows. So they were an extension of a comedy sketch. Um, I think they trivialized the real pain and the real anguish of women who have been groped and harassed. And so it's not about defending Al. It's about making it clear what us um, joking around during a photo shoot about a comedic sketch were about. That was Uber board member and Thrive Global CEO Ariana Huffington, along with Samesh Dash, IVP general partner. Well, the innovator behind Google's Android mobile platform left the company in 2014, but it is now coming to light that Andy Rubin departed after an accusation of inappropriate behavior. This according to a person familiar with the matter. The information first reported about Google's internal investigation into Rubin's conduct. Rubin has now taken a leave from his consumer hardware startup, Essential. He told the board he needed time off to deal with personal matters. Still ahead, talk about volatility. This week we saw Bitcoin surge past $11,000, only to drop more than 20%. And the fluctuations didn't end there. So is this a bubble? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. A 
A technical glitch may leave American Airlines without any pilots over the holidays. The scheduling flaw has left more than 15,000 flights without sufficient crew during the next month or so. The airline says the problem should be corrected in time to prevent service disruptions. It's also offering pilots one and a half times their normal hourly wage to pick up some of the flights. However, the union representing the pilots has filed a grievance, saying the proposed solution violates its labor pact. Well, this week, Bitcoin topped the headlines. The cryptocurrency spiked and caught the attention of Main Street, but its quick rise left many on Wall Street asking, when will this bubble pop? Adam White is vice president of Coinbase and joined us to discuss. Coinbase is an online platform that allows users to buy or sell Bitcoin by connecting with their bank accounts. It has almost tripled its user base this past year, now standing at 13 million. Take a listen. <laughs> So I think this is going to become the biggest bubble of our lifetimes by a long shot, uh, mostly because it's so I want global. the record to show I didn't say that. <laughs> mostly because it's so global. Novogratz is starting a $500 million fund to invest in cryptocurrencies and says Bitcoin could easily match gold's $8 trillion market cap. Adam White is vice president of Coinbase. He joins us now from New York. Coinbase is an online platform that allows users to buy or sell Bitcoin by connecting with their bank accounts. It has almost tripled its user base this past year, now standing at 13 million. So Adam, biggest bubble of our lifetime, do you agree? I don't know if I'd agree with that. I, I think that the price is an easy metric for everyone to point at and to look at. It's widely covered, it's fascinating, and it's it's uh, one important um, quantitative indicator to look at the success of this technology. But we spend a lot of time in the space also looking at what's the actual utility? How many people are using this technology? What's the daily transactional volume? That happens separate, separate from the price and that we're also seeing great growth in. Now, uh, talk to us about the growth at Coinbase, the accounts tripling to 13 million in the last year. You know, where do you see that growth going? Yeah, so we started this year with around 5 million retail customers on Coinbase.com. And Coinbase.com is effectively the easiest way to get started buying and selling with a little bit of digital currency. We're, we're now reporting um, over 12 million retail customers. And uh, what we've seen with that is really uh, uh, Coinbase becoming the easy on-ramp to the digital currency space. In addition to onboarding customers, we actually report our total trading volume, and we've seen over $50 billion worth of cryptocurrency traded on our platform alone. These are both great um, kind of leading indicators that we're seeing average everyday users now beginning to adopt and experiment with this technology. You know, it may not be the biggest bubble of our lifetime, according to you, but there is a lot of volatility. I want you to take a look at a chart on the Bloomberg G hashtag BTV1909. This compares Bitcoin's volatility to uh, the euro dollar, the most traded currencies out there. You know, what do you make of this volatility and, and how, how can people put trust in this, in this currency if this kind of volatility keeps up? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I do think this volatility is going to be short lived in the lifespan of digital currencies like Bitcoin. We are in the very early innings of the introduction of this technology right now. And rightfully so, we're watching the market kind of engage in this process of price discovery. And with that, we're seeing rapid increases and also recoveries, decreases in the price. What's really interesting is I co-authored a paper with uh, Chris Bernisky out of ARK Invest last year. And what we looked at was the 2016 volatility of Bitcoin compared to some other asset classes. And what we found that Bitcoin was as volatile as both oil and less volatile than Twitter stock in, in the year 2016. So in my opinion, we're seeing volatility right now. That's not a bad thing. More liquid markets with institutional capital entering the space is ultimately going to decrease that volatility and make digital currencies like Bitcoin a really viable uh, financial instrument for, for the world. That was Adam White with Coinbase. Meantime, Tesla CEO Elon Musk says no, he is not the person behind Bitcoin and that he's forgotten where he keeps his. Musk tweeted Tuesday in response to a viral blog post that suggested he is the creator of Bitcoin. Musk said, quote, not true. A friend sent me part of a Bitcoin a few years ago, but I don't know where it is. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. We'll continue our coverage of cryptocurrencies Wednesday. Tune in for our conversation with the CEO of Coinbase. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.